Uh, it's now noon, and I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar, Drying Food Safely. My name is Leigh Bridgman. I'm an Extension Program Assistant in Queen Anne's County, Maryland, and I'll be facilitating the session. Throughout the presentation, we'll be using the chat pod for questions, so please use the arrow key, select everyone, and type your question in, and the presenter will answer your question as soon as they're able. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors and collaborators listed on the slide and remind you of our upcoming webinars. On February 10th, the topic will be cover crop mixtures. As a reminder, our presentation will be recorded today. An email will be sent directly to you with a link to the archive presentation and any materials presented. Please feel free to share this email with your colleagues. The complete collection of archive webinars can be found on our website on the address listed in blue. And now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Beverly Jackie and Shona Henley to discuss drying food safely. All right. Thank you for joining us. My name's Shauna Henley. And I'm Beverly Jackie. So just to give you an idea of who we are and what we do, both Beverly and I are family and consumer sciences agents. I cover food safety, nutrition, and physical activity, mainly in the greater Baltimore area. So Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Harford, and Carroll County. Some of my specialties and certifications is that I've helped with co-teaching good agricultural practices. I'm an instructor for the Food Safety Modernization Act's Produce Safety Rule. I'm also a lead instructor proctor for ServeSafe, so food certification management classes. And then I'm also familiar with Maryland's cottage law, as well as some of the other laws um, related to food manufacturing and processing. I'm a lead instructor for the Food Safety Modernization Act, Preventive Controls for Human Foods. And so if you have any questions about food safety, please let me know. If I can't help you, I should know colleagues that will be able to help answer your questions from food safety anywhere along the farm to fork continuum. And I would say my specialty is definitely consumer food safety education. Hi, and I'm Beverly Jackie. I'm a family and consumer science educator, and I actually cover the counties of Cecil Kent and Queen Anne's on the Upper Shore. Uh, my background is I am a registered dietitian, so my um, experience and expertise is in um, nutrition, but particularly um, chronic disease management and prevention, as well as food safety, and of course, uh, food preservation, which kind of all ties in nicely. Um, I've been with Extension just about four years and uh, really enjoy teaching these programs. Um, I do want to preface that the presentation that we're presenting today is nor under normal circumstances is uh, an in-person presentation because we do provide a lot of interactive activities such as um, working with the drawing machines that we're going to reference, um, doing some uh, of your own um, activities with drawing foods and, and herbs in particular in the back. So uh, if you are interested in um, attending one of our in-person programs, you can contact your local uh, University of Maryland Extension office in your county. And if you're not um, from Maryland, then you can check your, uh, uh, your state extension offices and find out if they also provide um, food preservation programs. Okay, next slide. All right, we would like to acknowledge and give credit to the National Center for Home Food Preservation, which is housed at the University of Georgia, uh, Georgia's Cooperative Extension, and also the uh, So Easy to Preserve uh, sixth edition um, book, which is through Cooperative Extension, also the University of Georgia. This is just a list of our disclaimers. We'll give you like a moment to just read through. And this is uh, our poster that shows that the University of Maryland Extension programs are open to all without regard to race, color, 
national origin, sex, gender, gender identity, religion, age, weight and height, disability, political beliefs, sexual orientation, marital, family, and veteran statuses. Okay, um, just a little bit about uh, our objectives today. So um, food preservation has many benefits and it is environmentally sustainable because you can consume food from home gardens and local farms as well. Uh, it can also extend the shelf life of food. Uh, home preservation uh, techniques prevent spoilage and food waste. And also um, it's nutritious because home preserved foods retain the quality and nutrient value of food soon after the harvest. Uh, it is safer because you can control the ingredients and use tested recipes too, which um, are in that resource that we mentioned from the Center for Home Food Preservation. Okay, I'm just going to turn off my video at this point just to save on bandwidth. Okay, so a little bit about the history of um, uh, food preservation. So, so drying food dates back to about 12,000 BC. Uh, still houses were const uh, constructed and they used sun and wind to dry foods such as fruits and vegetables and herbs. And then from about 500 through the 1500s, still houses were still being constructed. However, now they were using fire um, to heat and dry foods. The uh, process of fermentation was practiced by many civilizations as far back as 10,000 BC. So for example, kimchi, which is a traditional side dish of uh, salted and fermented vegetables, uh, originated in Korea. Um, chutney, or fermented fruit, is a stable side dish from India. And then there's many cheeses that were first uh, fermented in many European countries. And freezing foods, uh, was popular during the early Middle Ages in most areas of uh, Europe, but it required the use of underground rooms and cellars, you know, to store the foods with or without ice. However, in the 1800s, Clarence Birdseye, and maybe you recognize his name, revealed that quick freezing at very low temperatures developed better tasting meats and vegetables. And then as we move into pickling, um, the origin of that really varies in, in terms of the time and culture, but it appears to have started somewhere in India around 4,000 years ago. And then finally, canning, which is actually the newest method of food preservation, was established in the late 1700s. And I will also note, too, that electricity allowed for a lot of these new methods for drying and freezing and canning, which is enabling now home preservers to increase the amount of food that they preserve at home. So why drive? Well, there's many benefits to drying. First, it's a simple a process that requires very little equipment, supplies, or ingredients. And also, drying can reduce the size and weight of food because the fluid is removed from the foods during the drying process. As I mentioned earlier, it can increase the shelf life of food. And therefore, it also requires less storage space as well. I think about it too, it's, it can be also very portable and dry foods can be very travel friendly. So for example, you know, dry foods are ideal for traveling or um, if you're into outdoor activities, uh, they're great for camping and backpacking as well. And also dried fruits and leathers, uh, can per, and we'll, per, we'll explain what leathers are in a moment, can provide quick energy. And um, sometimes dried foods are actually, especially fruits, are called nature's candy. Uh, they tend to be more concentrated in the natural sugars compared to fresh fruits. But they do contain those natural sugars as opposed to the added sugars. Also, if you think about foods such as jerky or nuts or seeds, they are great sources of protein and make great snacks as well. And then dried vegetables can be easily dehydrated into soups. And then the, the broth in the soups actually retains the nutrients, you know, from these vegetables once they become rehydrated in the soups. 
But there are some reasons why we shouldn't dry foods. Um, for example, depending on what foods you plan to dry, the drying process can take a lot of time. It can really vary from anywhere from an hour to several days. And also, drying requires monitoring, which means you have to check in on it periodically. And finally, not all foods can, can be dried or they do not dry well. For example, fruits that don't dry well include avocados, olives, pomegranates, and many citrus fruits. Now, it doesn't mean you can't dry them, but they just don't have that same texture and quality that some other fruits have when they're dry. Uh, vegetables don't, that don't dry well, uh, for example, would be anything that's very heavy or, or high in water, such as celery or different types of lettuces. And uh, Shauna will talk about this, but poultry is not recommended for jerky because of its uh, final texture and, and flavors. Okay, so here's some general steps to follow when you're drying some foods. And this is regardless of the process that you're choosing. So first, you want to make sure that you cut your food into very thin, uniform slices so that they will dry evenly. Also, you want to make sure that you're arranging foods in single layers to avoid touching or overlapping other pieces. You want to make sure you follow the directions of a tested recipe carefully. And as I mentioned earlier, that book, So Easy to Preserve, is just one resource that has tested recipes. We'll provide you some um, links and some other resources at the end of this presentation. You want to make sure that you start and rotate the uh, uh, tray frequently, and also that you check foods frequently near the end of the drying process. Okay, so here's some other factors that you want to consider, and these are very important when it comes to drying. So the first thing is temperature. Controlling the temperature during the drying process is very critical. Ideally, for most drying um, foods indoor, around 140 degrees is recommended. However, it's important that you use a tester recipe to assure you are drying food safely and also follow the instructions on that recipe. If temperatures are too low, what happens is the drying process takes longer and can actually cause microorganisms to grow. On the other side, if the temperatures are too high, case hardening can occur. Now, case hardening happens when the outside of the food is cooked, and the, but the water can't escape. So the inside is still moist, and then that moisture allows microorganisms to grow. Um, newer dehydrators that you can purchase have control settings that are ideal for different categories. So, for example, there might be a setting for fruits or vegetables or herbs or meat. So you also want to follow directions for your appliance as well as what your tested recipe is showing. The second factor that's very critical is, is humidity. Drying times and temperatures may vary depending on the method that you use and, of course, the relative humidity in your area. So, for example, if the surrounding area is very humid, then drying is going to take longer. And third, um, air circulation is also important. If air is not circulating well, the food will take longer to dry. And again, goes back to discussions about the increasing the risk of microorganism growth. So, bottom line is, Never hurry the drying process. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly go through some of the methods for drying foods. Um, when you're using that right combination of warm temperatures, low humidity, and air circulation, you can, you know, dry food safely using a variety of these methods indoor and outdoors. Um, outdoors, you could see vine, solar, and sun are recommended um, methods. However, it's important to know that outdoor drying is not recommended in Maryland because of the issues with humidity. So we're going to focus um, today on our discussion of indoor drying methods. 
for example, microwaving is a quick way to dry small quantities of herbs and some leaf, uh, leafy vegetables, but it's not necessarily the most successful for drying other foods. So using these indoor methods, too, we want to make sure that we're maximizing the nutrients and that the, uh, the food dries as soon as possible. And we want to make note here that to be wary of following, you know, methods that you might read about on blogs or see demonstrated by celebrity chefs, because they don't always use the safest drying methods. Uh, we will provide you with the science-based the science -based safe methods um, to follow. Okay, so I do want to mention a little bit about pasteurization. Um, even though we are not recommending or it's not recommended for um, drying in the state of Maryland, just to kind of give you some information about pasteurization and what it is in the event that you're perhaps drying um, foods in another state that allows for um, outdoor drying methods. So to produce a safe and high quality food product, it's important to kill any insect or their eggs through this pasteurization process. Now, there's two safe pasteurization processes or methods that you can use. The first is the freezer method. So this works by sealing food in a freezer-safe container and then placing it in the freezer that's set at zero degrees or below for at least 48 hours. Another method is the oven method. And this is where you would place food in a single layer on a tray, and then you place it in a preheated, uh, excuse me, preheated, pre preheated oven at 165, uh, excuse me, 160 degrees for about 30 minutes. So again, place it in a preheated oven for 160 degrees for 30 minutes. This process, if by any chance that you are doing any outdoor drying somewhere else, should be performed if you're using uh, either vine, sun, or solar drying methods before you actually pack up the food. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the indoor method. So the first method is um, room drying. And room or air drying takes place indoors in preferably a more controlled environment such as um, a well-ventilated attic, or a room, or even a screened-in porch. Room drying works best um, for most common foods, uh, for example, that you see up there, such as herbs, <clears throat> excuse me, unsalted nuts, hot peppers, and um, fruits as well. Weather does not impact uh, this method for obvious reasons because we're doing it indoors. Um, however, you do want to make sure that the space that you are using indoors is sunny and has very low humidity. In terms of the amount of work that you need to dry indoors, it's pretty minimal. For example, if you're drying herbs or peppers, um, basically you're stringing them on um, a piece of uh, string, you're tying them in bundles, and then you can suspend them until they're dry. You can use uh, and, uh, and close them in paper bags to protect them from dust or pollutants. That's what we generally recommend, and that would be an activity that we would show you how to do. If you're doing anything with unshelled nuts, for example, you need to place them on trays and keep them covered. So the proof for uh, room drying is that it can be done year-round. And also, foods don't need to be pre-treated, and Shauna will talk a little bit about that um, as she goes through some of the different types of foods in a moment. So you don't have to do any pre-treating for drying foods, uh, which makes it all the less work. And then since your drying occurs indoors, the air quality is more consistent and, of course, pollution-free. However, you should consider the season-related influences, such as if you're putting on air conditioning or um, high heats or fans or anything like that. The cons uh, for drying in Doors is sometimes the drying time. It's really going to vary based on the different type of food that you use. The next indoor method that you can dry successfully is using the oven. And this is great to use for dried meats, 
and vegetables, as well as some other food products. Um, just like any other indoor method, whether it's not as an intact method, uh, in terms of equipment, you do have to make sure that you have an oven that does, does not register, um, if an oven, excuse me, you have to use an oven that registers as low as 140 to 150 degrees. Um, and that's because anything above that temperature, you're going to start to cook the food. You have to make sure that the oven door is left open while the foods are drying, so the temperature has to also be monitored. And then you have to use a thermometer, and you need to place it uh, near the food so you get an accurate reading and, it need to adju and adjust the temperature of the oven as needed. So think about it, your oven door is left open, so you might have to adjust that temperature to make sure that that thermometer that's inside by your drying food is uh, around that 140 degrees. And sometimes you might need to use a fan to, to blow across the open um, oven door to increase that air circulation. So the pro is that hopefully most of us have ovens, um, however, um, and, and weather's not an issue, but the con for drying um, in the oven is that it takes twice as long as drying um, in a dehydrator, which we'll show you in a second, unless you're using a convention oven. Um, and in some cases, it can take up to 12 to 24 hours um, to dry foods. And um, the issues sometimes are um, case hardening can occur with leaving it in the oven, and also there's a safety hazard leaving that oven door, especially if you have small children at home. Okay, so let's take a look a little bit about some of the home uh, dehydrators that you can purchase. Because there are two different types in terms of how airflow occurs. So first off, a dehydrator is an electrical appliance that we can use indoors. It contains a heat element, a fan, and a vent for air, air circulation. And it usually uh, is equipped to heat foods up to that 140 degrees that I mentioned. Most foods can be easily dried using an electric dehydrator, except for milk and eggs. And um, as you see here, there's, there's two different types. So the horizontal one that you see on the left side of your slide, uh, the heating element and the fan are located on the side of the unit. So the major advantage um, for this type of unit is it reduces the flavor mixture, um, so several different foods can be dried at different times. All the trays receive equal heat penetration, and the juices or liquids can't drip down, or they don't drip down into the heating element because the elements are on the side. The unit on, on the right is considered a vertical airflow dehydrator. Now, that heating element and fan is located either on the lid or at the bottom of the base. So if different foods are dried, then flavors can mix and liquid can drip into the heating element if they are located at the base. So using this type of unit, um, you have to make sure that you frequently are um, rotating the trees, uh, the trays to ensure um, uniform drying. So here are some must-have um, features when you're thinking about purchasing a dehydrator. First of all, uh, you want to look at to make sure that the, it has a double wall um, uh, it's double walled and that it's either made of metal or a high grade plastic, not wood. Um, I can speak that I have an airflow one, uh, a circular one, and I have a plastic one, and it meets that criteria. And there's many different models and companies that make these types of um, dehydrators. You want to make sure the heating element is enclosed. You want to use a countertop design, meaning that you can put it on your counter anywhere in your kitchen or anywhere where you're going to be able to monitor it. You want to make sure it has a dial to regulate the temperature. And you also want to make sure it has a UL seal. So basically that UL seal um, is just tells you that several companies approved um, the safety of this um, through um, the U.S. Um, OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration Agency. Um, you want to make sure it has a, a hopefully a year guarantee. It absolutely has to have a fan or blower for that air circulation that I mentioned. And that the trays are either um, metal and very sturdy or they could be a washable mesh tray. There are some optional features that aren't necessarily um, needed. For example, an auto shutoff timer 
or a maintenance warranty. But um, those are just optional. They're not necessarily um, needed for when you're purchasing a dehydrator. So a little bit about the differences. Um, if you're looking at, at here, uh, at, at this list here, again, that horizontal airflow um, reduces, meaning the, um, the air is coming from the side, reduces flavor mixing. It can uh, dry more uniformly because the heating elements are hitting each of those trays evenly. Um, the elements um, stay clean because there's no dripping down. And then, um, but there is a limitation in the height of the food or the pieces that you could put in there. Now, the vertical um, um, airflow systems, uh, they have the, again, the heating element is either on the lid or the base. So if different foods are dry, flavors can mix and liquid can drip down on the heating element. So it's very important using these elements, and I can attest to that, that you have to uh, frequently rotate those um, uh, trays to make sure the foods on the top that are moved down to the bottom and then they're getting more of that airflow. So Sean is going to take us now through some specifics to follow about different types of foods. Great. Thanks, Beverly. So when we're talking about drying fruits, and you touched on this earlier, that dried fruits are very common for snacks, baking purposes, and even from that nutritious standpoint, we know that since we're losing water or moisture out of fruits, we're going to have that concentrated sweetness, and you're also going to have that calorie aspect to it, too. So one of those things from the nutrition side is that when you are drying fruits and eating them, just be mindful of the sugars and possible calories that you're consuming, just because by volume, there's a lot more in dried fruit compared to a whole apple, like you see here in the picture. So some of the things or general steps to think about when you are preparing fruit for drying is that you'll want to wash them under potable tap water. If you're using something like, or you're drying something like an apple, you can run your hands off the surface. If you have fruit that might have grown touching the soil, something like a cantaloupe, for example, you may want to use a produce brush to scrub the surface to make sure you're dislodging any soil or dirt that might be there. You also want to remove the core if there's a core to your fruit that you're drying. And there are different pretreatments that you see here, such as sugar, and we'll talk about some of the other items too. But for fruit, you're typically going to pre-treat them to help with the overall quality of the food item. And it's mainly to prevent discoloration. Again, in terms of drying the fruit, uniform pieces of fruit are going to dry at the same rate. And obviously, if you're trying to dry a whole piece of fruit, it's going to take much longer than if you sliced it in half or sliced it into smaller sections. And we also note here that if you peeled your fruit, it will also dry a little bit faster than if you left the skin on. So some of the different ways that you can pre-treat your fruit prior to drying include different sugar solutions as well as non-sugar methods. So sulfuring, sulfite dips, ascorbic acid, steam blanching, and salt dips. And again, these methods are mainly to help with discoloration of the cut fruit. We won't go into each of them, but this could be one of those trial and error pieces that you test out if you were looking to sell dehydrated foods to your customers. Another thing, too, that makes drying fruit unique is that you'll want to have a process called conditioning. So after your fruit has dried, and you'll normally want the fruit to dry and then cool down for about 30 to 60 minutes. And once your dehydrated 
fruit slices have cooled for that 30 to 60 minutes, you'll want to store them in a moisture proof container and you're going to condition them. And conditioning is really just making sure that you've had moisture loss, the fruit slices, because we know that if there's moisture, there's the potential for molds and other microorganisms to grow to spoil that product. And we don't want that. So for conditioning, it's going to help assure that you have evenly dried fruit pieces. Some things to note, too, is that patience is a good thing here when you're letting your dried fruit cool because packaging dehydrated fruit too soon, you could have moisture that's retained that leads to mold and spoiled food product. But then if you package foods too long after cooling, you might have your fruit slices reabsorbing moisture from the air. So there's that happy medium kind of situation going on here. In terms of storing your dried fruit, moisture-proof containers ideal so it doesn't absorb moisture again. And with the conditioning, we recommend that you use a glass or clear container that seals well just because you'll be able to see any sort of condensation or moisture inside that container. Because if I saw moisture inside a container with my dried fruit, it would clue me in that, oh, I need to extend the drying process, so maybe I'm putting those dried slices back into my dehydrator or oven. And typically, too, with the conditioning, you can expect that you'll want to shake that jar of dried fruit about once a day for seven to 10 days to make sure that there's no extra condensation or moisture inside that container. For vegetables, again, this is a great way to make soups, stews, or other food items that you're using for dried vegetables. Even making something like kale chips is a great idea with excess vegetables if you're growing them. So when we look at drying vegetables, some of the general preparation steps that you would want to follow is that you're going to want to pick high quality produce for optimum flavor and nutrients. Again, you'll want to wash or rinse your vegetables under potable water. You can either air dry your vegetables or use clean paper towels to help speed the process up because we know any sort of wet vegetable will just take longer to dry later on. Based on the recipe that you're following, they may ask you to trim or peel the vegetable. And again, making sure that you're cutting them into uniform slices for even drying times and even eye appeal and aesthetics. Ideally, you'll want to pick, wash, and dry your vegetables within a certain time frame, just because any time that you pre-wash vegetables and let's say put them in your refrigerator to dry the next day, that extra moisture could start spoiling produce and even the natural enzymes in your fruits or vegetables could be inching your produce more towards spoilage than optimum flavor. Unlike fruits, with your vegetables, your pretreatment is going to either be a water blanching or a steam blanching method. And we have two pictures of both. So on the left, we see the water blanching. On the right, we have the steam blanching. And we'll share the resources so you know how long the blanching times are for different vegetables. Typically with water blanching, as you can see here, you bring a pot of water to a full boil, and then you'll submerge your vegetable slices or pieces into the boiling water for a certain amount of time. Often that will be, you'll dunk your vegetables into an ice water or under cold running water to start cooling down the vegetables so they retain their color 
and they retain their nutrients as well. And then if you do use steam blanching, it can take a little bit longer than water blanching. But again, this is just going to be trial and error in terms of what method of blanching and pretreatment works for you. Typically, onions, green peppers, and mushrooms can be dried without blanching. So these are just some good tips for your drying methods with vegetables and their best practices. When you're looking at drying vegetables, again, depending on the vegetable, the size of the cut, it's going to take longer or shorter amount of time for them to dry. Beverly talked about some of the different environmental factors and even what method you use to dry in terms of how that translates to that extended drying time. But with vegetables, you typically know that they're going to be dry until they're brittle or crisp. You don't need to condition them once they've dried and cooled like fruit, just because vegetables typically have less moisture compared to fruit. And again, you would want to store your dried vegetables in an airtight container. In addition to storing your dried vegetables in an airtight con container, even for dried fruit and other dried food products, storing your dried product in a cool, dark, dry place and using them within a year is some of those best practices that we recommend. If you're looking to make some dried jerky products, again, you'll want to make sure that you keep food safety in mind. Jerkies are a great protein source to keep on hand for any sort of activities that you do. But some of the things that you do want to keep in mind with jerky is that you want to be smart about picking your protein. We did mention that poultry is typically not recommended because of the dry texture, but you still might want to make a jerky product out of poultry. Other items to consider when you are picking a protein, you want to choose lean meat just because a fatty piece of protein could go rancid over time more easily. Typically, we've seen people make jerkies out of beef and pork, wild game, and ground beef. If you're making a jerky out of ground beef, you'll typically use um, an extruder to get the right mold or consistency that you're looking for. And then, again, we do have a note that just like any food product, there is a risk of foodborne pathogens. So making sure that food safety is in the forefront of your mind, whether it's with drying fruits and vegetables or making jerkies, food safety is there. Another thing to note is making sure that you have a good food thermometer so you can test the internal temperatures for those different jer jerky products. So a digital, a digital food thermometer that's properly calibrated, typically with poultry, you'll want 165 degrees Fahrenheit internal temperature prior to drying. And then typically for all the other jerkies, you're looking at a safe internal temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit prior to drying. But again, we'll make sure that you have some resources to look into proper jerky. Other popular items that people like to dry are herbs. And this is one of the easiest methods too. Um, personally, I like to air dry herbs inside our house. And some of the things too when you are drying herbs is that the best time to harvest herbs for flavor is going to be just before the flowers first open where they are in the budding stage. And you'll want to harvest the herbs in the early morning after the dews evaporated just to minimize wilting and help speed up that drying time. In terms of methods for drying herbs, again, we'll recommend air drying, 
using a dehydrator, a microwave, or oven. Other food items that people like to dry are going to be seeds and possibly peanuts. And you can see some pictures of peanuts and other sort of tree nuts. So when you are thinking about drying any sort of seeds or nuts, you're going to want to make sure that you're thinking about the temperature. Just because it's very easy to start roasting a seed or nut versus drying them. So in terms of drying seeds and nuts, you'll typically see that the temperature is going to be lower compared to roasting. When we think about drying seeds and nuts, you'll want to use a dehydrator or an oven. Sun drying, again, we don't recommend just because the humidity in Maryland or in the mid-Atlantic area is typically 60% or more, which is not ideal for outdoor drying. And then just to give you an idea of what we would describe as roasting seeds or roasting nuts, roasting for us, we define as typically tossing in oil and some salt and roasting in a shallow pan in your oven at 350 degrees for 10 to 15 minutes. Whereas to dry something like peanuts, whether it's drying your peanuts in shell or unshelled, your oven temperature is going to be set at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And typically for the temperature for drying peanuts, whether they're shelled or unshelled, can range from 20 to 25 minutes. So we see that roasting versus drying, roasting has a higher oven temperature and often a shorter time required to roast compared to drying. So some of the things that we hope you take away from our presentation for best practices for drying is that you want to keep things clean and sanitized in your kitchen. If you're marinating jerky, you want to marinate jerky in a refrigerator. You want to make sure that you have properly calibrated food thermometers at your disposal. And then for any of the recipes, make sure that you preheat your dehydrator or your oven temperature that the recipe calls for. So you never want to put your apples that you're dehydrating in the oven that hasn't been pre-treated or preheated to the temperature that you want. Again, making sure that you're monitoring the temperature because any temperature above 140 degrees Fahrenheit is going to put you into the cooking phase of the food. And also, if you have a temperature higher than 140 degrees Fahrenheit, can put you into that case hardening risk, where, again, as Be Beverly talked about, case hardening is when the outside of the food gets hard. However, there's moisture trapped inside the food that over time could start molding and spoiling that food product. You always want to make sure that whatever you dehydrated cools to room temperature before packing. And again, storing your food items that you dried in a cool, dark, and dry location. We will not do this. So, we have... We have several questions. Um, I can either read them and we can respond. Um, it's up to you. Sure. Let's open it up for questions. Okay. Um, first, there was a comment from someone about that they love kimchi and chutney. So that sounds like maybe fermentation um, uh, food, uh, food preservation might be right up your alley. Uh, let's see. Uh, next, we have... Um, Something, I'm just trying to scroll through here about. Um, Let's see, so I see a question about what class or programs do you recommend for food safety certification? Um, so depending on what your goal is, 
for the foods that you're either growing or looking to process and manufacture is going to dictate what kind of food safety certifications you may need. So, um, Stephanie, if you don't mind uh, adding to that in terms of what kind of area you're looking at, food safety at the farm, food safety at processing, um, let us know and we can specify a little bit more. Then I, I haven't heard any mention of freeze drying. Is this due to the price point or are there other factors to consider when going that route? So typically with freeze drying, we haven't talked a lot about that as a group of family and consumer science agents just because the price point to invest in a freeze dryer is three to four thousand dollars and that might not be feasible for every individual. However, there may be opportunities to look at food incubators, um, reaching out to maybe some of the local restaurants that might allow you to use their freeze-dry machine, machinery. Um, there also might be small grant opportunities too that would allow you to buy this type of equipment for your farming operation. Another question is, why is preheating so essential? And what happens if you put apples in before it's the right temperature? Uh, Beverly, would you like to answer this question while I bring up some websites? Okay, I'm sorry, can you read that back? Because I don't see that question in my chat, Sean. It's uh, in my Q&A for some reason. Or maybe it's in the chat. I'm sorry. It's in the chat. You? So why oh, is preheating okay. so essential? What would happen if you put sliced apples in the oven before it hit the right temperature? Um, so we're talking about drying fruits in the oven. Is that, is that what I'm hearing correctly? Is that, I just want to... Or just in general, why would you want to preheat your oven or your dehydrator prior oh, okay. to putting the food in? Okay, I'm sorry, I thought you said pre-treat. Um, well, it's important that you, you're reaching that temperature um, that's essential to make sure that you're, you're drying, you're at a temperature for drying and not cooking. So you want to make sure that you're, you're um, especially if you're following the recipe, that you're hitting that temperature before you put the foods in there. And then what's also important, too, once you put your fruits in there and you're using that oven and the door is open, then you have to continue to monitor that temperature to make sure it stays at that temperature because because the door is open, um, you know, the heat is going to be lost and you may have to readjust your oven to make sure that it stays at that, if it's at 140 temperature uh, that you're striving for. And that's why people sometimes use that fan because it helps circulate that air. So I'm hoping I answered your question. I'm sorry, I was looking through other questions when you were reading that, Tana, so I'm, um, sorry for having to repeat that. Are, are you still there? Oh, yeah, I'm talking muted. Let's see, I was going to say, oh, sorry. <laughs> we have one person uh, calling in or listening in from Portugal. I'm not as familiar with the Portuguese food standards, but I do know that the EU does have some pretty comparative food safety regulations and expectations to the United States. So I'm sure there's some good recommendations for drying food safely in Portugal or the EU from that point of view. One of the websites I wanted to share with everyone, let me just, uh, let's see, open it up. And I did put the link in the chat box. It's the Maryland Department of Health's website for facility and process review. So this is probably going to be one of your favorite websites, hopefully, if you're going into more of that processing food manufacturing aspect. 
Um, some of the things that I did want to highlight, if you are interested in cottage food, they do have a link to check out. But more specifically for this group and this presentation, underneath processing and guidelines here, you'll want to review on-farm home processing plan review guidelines. They have a link for on-farm step-by-step process licensing, as well as on-farm foods and definitions. Uh, the key thing here is that some of you may be aware that the Maryland Department of Health logo changed. So the more current name is going to be the Maryland Department of Health. Um, I think the old acronym was MDHM, I, for, I forget, but this is going to be the name and more of the current logo that you'll want to see on documents if you're looking into the Department of Health and licensing and paperwork processes. So here we see that for on-farm home, on home processing foods and definitions, this document provides guidance for allowable foods to be produced and sold from an on-farm home processing business located in Maryland. And uh, Kumar, or Kumar is basically the Maryland Code of Regulations from anything from child care facilities to food preparation. And so the 10.15 is going to be more applicable to that food space. So based on the state regulations, states, the department may issue a food processing plant license to an individual who owns a farm to process food in a home or domestic kitchen located on the individual's farm and has annual revenues from the sale of on-farm products in an amount not to exceed $40,000. Um, they do have the phone number here if you have other questions. But I think the key thing here is that if this is an avenue that you're looking to expand your farm operation into, knowing what foods are allowed to be made on your home property. So we do see here breads, certain canned foods. Based on our conversation or our presentation today, we do see that dried fruits and vegetables are on the list. If you're looking to make jerkies, that would require some extra and different licensing. So again, I will put the website here in the chat box. Shauna, we had a couple other questions I just wanted to um, um, respond to before we end our session. So one of the questions, was um, what is the general shelf life of dried fruits? So I'll kind of take that and you can add on to it. I think it really depends on not only the fruit, but where you're storing it. Um, you, because the, if you're storing it at a, a higher temperature, in other words, you know, if your home is 80 degrees or something like that, it's probably going to have a shorter shelf life. But generally speaking, Shauna, up to nine months, nine to, nine months to a year is is pretty standard for dried fruit. Is that correct? Yeah, I wouldn't um, go longer than a year, just because things might get too brittle. Uh, again, depending, like you said, how things are being stored, you might run into some moldy conditions or overly tough food items. Okay. There was another question about will foods lose nutrients in the drying process? Not necessarily so because um, if if they were um, if well, it's fruit or whatever and it's pre-treated properly and you're following the recipe, actually drying process can retain the nutrients. Um, there was a question in here and I can't seem to find it, but it was in relationship to humidity, um, and I think this was I'm not sure if it was a, and for outdoor or indoor, but um, I think I see it again. Uh, please tell me, Shauna, isn't, uh, in terms of drying food, you, um, you don't want to have a humidity above 50 or 60 percent, is that correct? 60 percent, yeah. 60 percent. Okay. You want your humidity level 
to be less than 60% for best drying conditions. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. I think what's happening is we're having questions in Q&A, which I'm looking at. There must be questions in chat as well, which is great. Lots of questions. So if you still have some more, we're still on here for a few more minutes. Please um, pose your questions. I'm just seeing if I missed anything in the Q&A section. And then the website that I brought up is the National Center for Home Food Preservation, sponsored by the University of Georgia's Cooperative Extension. And you can see here that they give a range of different food products that you can dry. Uh, if I go into, oh, let's let's see what they have for fruits and vegetables. Actually, have, that yeah, that answers. I'm sorry to interrupt, but that answers the next question. Is there a list of fruits and vegetables? bowls and foods that can be dried. So there you go. Thank you. Yep. And this will also go into more specifics, as you can see, about sun drying. Uh, Beverly and I didn't touch on that just because it's not recommended for the Maryland conditions. But if, again, if you're in a different state or a different country, you may have lower humidity and the right temperature of 85 degrees Fahrenheit that would allow you to optimally dry certain food items outside. So they do also go a little bit more in depth about pre-treating fruit with the sulfuring, the sulfite dips that we just alluded to. So that could be a useful resource. Uh, if you are interested in purchasing a book that we were talking about, the book is called So Easy to Preserve, 6th edition. Let's see. And I actually have a copy of it. This is what it looks like. Hold it right. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so here's the book. And you can order it from the University of Georgia's website. And I'll put that into the chat box. Um, sometimes, too, you can reach out to your local extension office to see if they have a book for purchase. Just to kind of show off our extension website, if you are interested in learning more about food preservation, whether it's drying, freezing, canning, feel free to visit extension.umd.edu. Click the little dinner plate over on the left. We'll have food preservation, and you'll see here that you can kind of see on the map who some of the educators are that are helping with canning, freezing, drying topics, as well as some other resources that might be useful. And Shauna, we may want to mention too, um, we'll start offering um, our canning program uh, as, as the spring harvest begins. So check, especially if you live in the university, I'm sorry, if you live in Maryland or close by, uh, check the University of Maryland Extension's website and we'll be posting our programs. You know, obviously right now we're still gonna be virtual, so they're gonna be open to anyone out, you know, within the state or outside the state. And then I would recommend too, um, from a food safety standpoint, if you are looking to rent hours from a certified kitchen, whether it's your local church that has a certified kitchen or a restaurant off hours, um, make sure that you check in to see what their expectations are of you. It may be the case that if you're looking to create a product in a restaurant, they may need you to become Serve Safe certified or another sort of food managing certificate, either from a national or a county level, just so they have the confidence that you know how to handle food safely um, from that perspective. I'm trying to think what else. Did you did did you guys see the um a question from Susan about drying herbs on a, a larger scale? Do you have um a recommendation for her to get more information about this? So in terms of a larger scale, um what kind of scale? Uh she says small farm. Small farm. Drying herbs, yeah. 
there are, depending on the size, I guess, of the herbs that you're trying to dry, you might be able to look into purchasing a larger sort of food dehydrator that's more commercial oriented versus consumer smaller size dehydrator that would be countersized. Not sure if that helps. And again, you'll also want to become familiar with your county environmental health services to see what kind of regulations and certificates that they may require to of you if you are doing more on farm processing or other avenues of food manufacturing. I think there was one more question that I might have missed you guys answering. They were asked about using plastic storage bags for storage. So for plastic storage bags, I think it all depends. Um, you would want to use a food grade plastic. It doesn't matter um, what foods you're storing in it. You would want to make sure that it's food grade, food safe. And then also think about is the structure of the plastic going to be appropriate for what I need stored? Because if I was making tortilla chips, storing them in a plastic bag wouldn't be ideal because all those chips would get crushed into tortilla powder. So making sure that whatever sort of storage container you're using is going to keep that food product in good quality. If you are looking or thinking about equipment to buy um, that has maybe a higher food safety standard, again, Beverly mentioned looking for the UL seal. Another one is looking at equipment that has an NSF seal on it. So those are some other ways that you can look to make sure cooking equipment is appropriate for the process. Another thing too, um, typically using food grade metal or plastic is always a good thing. Um, you can use wood, but a lot of times wood equipment, wood tools, whether it's out on the fields or in your home kitchen, is harder to clean and possibly sanitize when you need to. So um, trying to gear towards more of that commercial kitchen process of Food grade metals like stainless steel as well as food grade plastics um, might be useful. Great. Well, I think those are all the questions that I see. Um, thank you guys so much. It looks like everyone enjoyed it and uh, reminded everyone that you will be getting a link to the presentation so you'll be able to review and um, we'll get other information uh, provided in the that email as well um, that, that would be important to you. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks.